thank you, Debbie. Good clapping. <laughs> um, it's nice to do the first lecture in the series. My, that's my chosen format. I know other formats will vary. And um, I am thrilled to be the first female director of Tate Modern. And uh, this is my first time on stage at the Courtauld. Um, I have, in fact, been teaching uh, on the curatorial programme uh, really since its inception. I've had great pleasure meeting every year of students. And this year is the first year I won't be teaching on the programme. I don't feel I can do that as director. But so there's a, you know, tonight the, 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 the seminar I would have given had I been speaking to this year's students. Um, but uh, for a number of years before that, I was a regular uh, reader and marker of MA dissertations for Sarah Wilson until I have to confess I could no longer understand them. <laughs> so, such was the theory, and um, particularly the French theory that Sarah has uh, uh, um, My encounter with art history began many years ago, but it was really cemented when I was at Cambridge, uh, nodding off in the back of uh, the warm lecture hall on Scroop Terrace, and so I thought I would begin with a um, a kind of classic a juxtaposition <laughs> of images, just imagine these are two slides. Um, both works are in the Tate's collection on your, what is that, left-hand side, uh, Kandinsky's Cossacks from 1910, and on the right-hand side, Tanya Bruguera's um, Tatlin's Whisper uh, from 2008. And uh, they're, they're the images for me that kind of span uh, the modern collection, International Art at Tate. <laughs> Uh, the International Collection begins in 1900 and runs to the present day, and Kandinsky you know, re represents that early moment in the 20th century of real innovation, a transition for, from depicting content uh, to uh, abstraction, hugely radical as, as its time. I think Gombrich describes it in his section on experimental art, but now really embedded in uh, a kind of canon of art history that uh, visitors and uh, uh, curators and uh, art historians really want to experience at the museum. It's a story in a way of art's disengagement with the real world. Uh, on the uh, opposite side is a work where the artist is insistently asking us to re-engage with the real world. It's a work that comprises two mounted policemen uh, using uh, classic crowd control techniques uh, images uh, responding to media images uh, of, of protests worldwide, but activated by surprise, by perchance, by with no uh, uh, previous announcement in the museum, uh, uh, embracing the audience as uh, bystanders and kind of um, uh, 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 participate, participating in the artist's social practice. So, um, opposite ends of the spectrum opposite ends of the, the, the hundred years, and really plotting a kind of trajectory from art um, immersed in its own world, with its own values, uh, with its own inherent intrinsic meanings, and artists, many artists, um, need, desire, uh, commitment now to reaching out and engaging with audiences in new ways. So one real world, one connecting, uh, uh, one connection between, because of both artworks, of course, content-wise, refer notion, reference notions of civil strife, of revolution, and using the kind of classic equestrian motif in art history. The, the challenge for those of us who work in museums like Tate Modern is to create an experience, an underhand, understanding of the past that can encompass both these, uh, both these um, dimensions. Um, the Kandinsky was painted just seven years before Tate began acquiring uh, foreign art. It relates very closely to the beginnings of the revolution in Russia. And just as revolution broke out in Russia in 1917, a small revolution took place on the banks of the Thames at Millbank when the trustees of the National Gallery of British Art took the decision uh, to acquire foreign art. So next year will be, our, like the Russian Revolution, will be our 100th anniversary. Um, in thinking about the past, looking at the past through the lens of the present, I wondered what pasts I should be talking about. So I thought I would begin with Milbank's own prehistory, Tate, Tate Britain's prehistory, uh, on the banks of the Thames, on the site of uh, Milbank Prison. Uh, Milbank Prison was established about 100 years uh, before Tate Britain. Um, it was uh, a really radical innovation in its own time. It had a hundred. It had 1,500 cells, 
the kind of precursor to the white cube in some ways. <laughs> it had three miles of corridors, and it was a pioneer, proud pioneer of solitary confinement. Um, it also was an early, uh, early adopted the form of the panopticon, a way of observing uh, its inmates at all times and securing, securing them in, in their confined spaces. And there, there's so many parallels with the museum, um, and I love those. You know, we, museums take objects from the real world, they denude them of their friends and their contacts, they lock them up in rooms uh, to be rarely visited by uh, uh, um, uh, individuals coming to inspect their well-being. Uh, the museums get bored of them, uh, they ship them abroad. I mean, I thought that, you know, the POM, the POMs who founded uh, the cultural history of Australia, prisoners of Millbank. So, you know, this prehistory of Tate is very much part of the, the global story. Um, and there is a picture of a panopticon. Um, when I joined the Tate at the end of the 1980s, as Debbie said, uh, I wasn't a curator, I was appointed as an assistant keeper. And of course the keeper is the person who guards as a prison or gate. Um, and of course the early years for me at Tate Modern were very much about caring for the objects in the collection. Um, it was a collection, as I say, of foreign art, uh, initially called non-British art, but when I was there, it had matured to foreign art, but it hadn't quite matured to international art. Um, and it was a collection that was very much put um, together in the shadow of and uh, the shadow of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and uh, according to the kind of route map that Alfred Barr and his team originated uh, during the 1930s. And I won't show you those classic images because I'm sure they're at least for all your students they're kind of ingrained somewhere in. In your, in, your, in your heads, um, they are the canon. And uh, there was very much, when I joined the Tate, still this uh, sense that there was an ideal history to be told, it was the story of pure abstraction and biomorphic abstraction, and then how it developed in the aftermath of the Second World War. It reflected uh, the interests of uh, many curators and directors and their deficits, and their good judgment, their mistakes. It also reflect, reflected fashions in collecting uh, in the UK, and perhaps the absence of the kind of visual cultural commitment that you find in the, uh, in the United States. It, it, uh, it reflected uh, Britain's love affair with the European art it, before the Second World War, and then its dalliance with America uh, after the Second World War. And uh, my, I was appointed by Ronald um, Richard Morfitt, wonderful, legendary uh, keeper of the modern collection, but his predecessor, Ronald Alley, who had just I retired when I joined the Tate, had published a, a, a handbook to the collection where he really uh, announced that the Tate was on the verge of filling the gaps that had existed in the collection. So there was this, there was this notion that we were almost there, we had a, almost a, a full um, history to tell. We now needed Tate Modern because this building was just not big enough, but it was also not big enough to undertake the kind of ambitious exhibitions that we were beginning to do in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, when the keeper, during the 1990s, became curator, uh, the exhibition programme really began to be something uh, that was very important, both to drive footfall, but I think the, the curatorial role was changing from one that, that really reflected on history and, and kind of secured and respected the objects to one in which curators wanted to be part, part historian too and be part of that re-examining of history. And I was lucky enough, as Debbie has said, to have some great shows to work on Paris post-war in 1993 and then Rites of Passage in 1995 with Stuart Morgan. And Paris post-war was, I suppose, a, a really deep investigation into the canon. It was about looking at context and how artists and art comes out of networks of affinity and conversations and juxtapositions. And then Rites of Passage was a look at contemporary practice at the, the end of the millennium, and it contained within it uh, works of art that physically could not really be housed comfortably in the galleries that we had at the Tate at Millbank. So that really laid the curatorial ambition to think big about history, to really explore uh, material beyond the collection and the need of the collection itself drove, drove the, the desire to take on and uh, find a new home for the collection. So that was the Tate Modern. Um, sometimes in its early years, I can't quite remember what, what that um, 
that, when that image was taken, but without the extension that we have today. And uh, as, uh, again, as Debbie said, Yvonne Blaswick and I and a small team of people had the incredible opportunity, it was incredible, to have two years to rethink sort of the nature of the museum, uh, to find out what we had in the collection. We'd had such a little space at Millbank, we, could hard, we hardly knew what we had. And to then really think about, if, you have a, if you've got a fresh start, what, what ways might you think about telling the story of the 20th century? Um, we went through many iterations, did lots of consultation, and were particularly mindful of the way artists talk to us. We, we, we talked to people about how you look at history, how do you tell art history? And one of the things that we found repeatedly uh, voiced by the artists that we spoke to was that um, artists don't think chronologically. They don't think what happened yesterday, I must do better tomorrow. They don't see themselves in a kind of linear chain of um, action and reaction, but they, um, for the most part, um, plunder history. They're time travellers. They seek a, a inspiration from you know, a whole range of sources that take you way beyond visual culture. They're, they're magpies. Uh, influence doesn't work in a linear way. And uh, from this idea of a much more sort of expansive, uh, a fluid, a flexible way of thinking about the past, we came up with this uh, idea to use themes drawn from art history, so rooted in a kind of understanding of subject matter, genre, think of the sort of early modern period, but then to, it, to take each one of those in its, in a, in the, with the idea of an expanded field across the 20th century, so that in any part of the, the display you would have an anchor in this idea of the subject, but you'd be really looking at these kind of contexts and juxtapositions and connections between works of art. And it was very much about connecting past and present, and very much about taking down, stripping bare, some of those possibly um, archaic uh, or incomprehensible or, or unnecessary barriers and boundaries and hierarchies that underpin a more conventional reading of art history. Um, so these are the, as it were, uh, book uh, frontis pieces to the four uh, thematic hangs. And uh, I won't uh, talk in detail about the, um, oh, maybe I haven't done an image of it. I won't talk in detail about the content, but those of you who, will, uh, who visited will remember some of these juxtapositions, Monet with Richard Long, for example, was one particularly notorious or celebrated um, <laughs> example uh, to cite. Um, the response to the hang was really interesting. I think many, many people coming to the first time thought we were uh, throwing the collection into this rather um, interesting uh, mix to obscure the gaps in the collection. Of course, there were no gaps. Um, <laughs> and then I remember, uh, I can't remember, Brownie or somebody writing in October that it was the most over-curated uh, hang of a museum collection that had ever taken place. We, we rather liked that comment, though I think it was a criticism. Um, <laughs> but I think also that there was a, there was a real feeling that the, the lack of borders, the, uh, the departure from chronology, somehow was very destabilising, and people felt very insecure. And I remember... Chris Green, uh, uh, um, having a long chat with, chat with Chris Green, who was then still actively teaching at the Courtauld, and he said, you know, you've robbed us. <laughs> you've robbed us of our, our kind of reason for being here. You're having all the fun. We like to come and see a permanent uh, uh, hang and mix it all up in our students' minds, and you're doing that in, you know, on the very walls themselves. But and, and in, you know, in retrospect, it was hugely over-curated, and there were connections between displays that we were wonderfully proud of, and I don't suppose anybody visiting ever explored or noticed them. But it was, in hindsight, hugely liberating, because by taking us outside of, or kind of dropping convention and the rule book and shuffling the pack, we did see that there were some grave omissions or kind of um, inexplicable... Um, uh, absences from the collection. I mean, where were the women? You know, just very simply, where was photography? Where was the moving image? Um, where was anything made outside Europe and North America? And so uh, insistently, uh, we ha had uh, and kind of um, almost unconsciously put in place a template that uh, set the ground for rethinking <coughs> some of those histories uh, that our collection supposedly addressed 
but did only do so within this uh, narrow NATO framework and only did so within a kind of uh, medium hierarchy of painting and sculpture. <coughs> so over the next few years, really, um, we did two things to address that. One, we began to think about ex exhibitions programs that would take us beyond the collection. And many museums across the globe, you'd have one kind of collection and then do an exhibition program that takes them a long, travels a long distance. So you think of MoMA's current program now in New York, a very canonical hang, but its exhibition program is pretty global. So we were uh, taking on that same uh, journey. Uh, Century City was the first uh, exhibition that took place at Tate Modern in 2001. So it was in preparation as we were thinking about the hang, and it was a it was a, a, an exhibition that took that idea of Paris post-war, of a kind of zone in a city where you get a kind of moment of cultural, a kind of flashpoint where things happen and the paradigm shifts. But instead of looking at it just in relation to kind of European and North American cities, it looked at Mumbai, at Lagos, at Rio de Janeiro. So it suddenly became uh, an exhibition that had a global parameter from, uh, from, being, from an art history that was centered in the West, there are a number of alternative centres in non-Western uh, areas. And at the same time, we began to look at uh, contemporary art in a much more global way. And of course, all of us uh, at that time who were curating were travelling. We were going to biennials in Guangzhou and Havana and Sao Paulo and art fairs in Miami. And everywhere we were seeing fantastic contemporary art made outside the, the geographical boundaries of Tate's collection. So there was an increasing mismatch between the permanent collection and uh, the uh, exhibitions programme. And of course, um, it, at Tate, curators, unlike many other museums, work across all projects. C collection curators also make exhibitions, also work on displays. So everybody was feeling this tension in their own, uh, own careers, really, between an interest in what was happening in... Uh, Latin American city and hanging a collection that was really about the access between London and Paris. So over a number of years we took the decision to build the collection and reflect the kind of uh, strength of contemporary practice globally and we set up our acquisitions groups. I, won't, I don't want to talk about money but we found ways of funding through philanthropy. But very quickly in that process we realised of course that uh, if we're going to collect artists from Africa uh, or Asia or the Middle East, we were doing a gross disservice to their practice and the history of art if we could not reflect their own genialities in their local histories. So uh, by about 2006, 2007, we decided that the strategy to collect globally had to reflect both the strength of contemporary practice and the kind of complex connections in art history which would give a, 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 a narrative uh, to a more kind of polycentric version of, uh, of art uh, across the world. Um, this was apparent not just from our own observations, but you know, if you went to Romania and you talked to young Romanian artists about their histories, they didn't cite Joseph Boyce as the artist who brought them towards the social practice. They cited Anna Lupash. You know, artists barely known outside Romania, rooted in the city of Cluj, somebody like Boyce who has a sort of social practice. She was a teacher for 30 years. There isn't a Romanian artist alive who hasn't been influenced by, come through the kind of uh, philosophy and, uh, and kind of teaching technique and approach to making art in the community that Anna Lupash uh, enacted. Uh, another artist of that era who had huge ramifications uh, for artists in the region was the extraordinary um, Polish fibre artist Magdalena Abakanovic, who went on to influence a huge generation of artists internationally working with fabric and artists who for many generations were not really considered artists, they were considered artists who, or craft makers. So Magdalena Abakanovic and then her connections with Lenore Tawney who was the great weaver who influenced Agnes Martin Subsequently, Sheila Hicks, influenced by uh, Lenore Tawney, and then moving to another uh, 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 continent, Marilina Mukherjee, who shortly before her death I visited uh, in Delhi, and she spoke uh, with enormous fondness and affection 
of uh, Magdalena Abakanovich's work as being the, the artist who set her, set her on, on, on her journey. So just a, a couple of snapshots of the kind of chains of reaction, the constellations of connections in some of these really important uh, narratives in history that were completely absent from uh, Tate's collection or from the written histories uh, that, that we're familiar with. So, you know, canons emerge very slowly. And at least I think in the art world, um, they are very much tied up to the marketplace and to institutions, most famously, as I said, MoMA, in relation to uh, the Western world. Um, but, you know, I always quote T.S. Eliot's remarks, every new work of art impacts on all the works that preceded it, and we must allow for new readings of the past in time and in place. And so maybe, in a way, you know, Tate Modern, the museum of the 21st century, is simply that, one that's kind of capable of continuously reflecting on the past through the lens of the present. Um, so the opening of the new Tate Modern, um, for me, uh, as the first director, uh, was a kind of manifesto moment. And um, the, the things that I think I felt very strongly about to bring to the brand were that new sense of a kind of international engagement, but also bringing uh, generations of great uh, women artists from out of the shadow. And many of those women artists are artists who throughout their careers have avoided what I think Linda Nocklin called the easel and pedestal syndrome. Because painting and sculpture and the canon is so dominated by a male elite, they have often worked in the margins with fibre, with performance, with emerging technologies. So they haven't been subsumed into the marketplace. You cannot buy them at auction. And much of the building of Tate's collection has been by word of mouth, you know, Romanian artists, introduction to Anna Lupash, visit to home, discussion, no dealer, no auction house, uh, and built in a really organic way. And, and I suppose one of the challenges now is to, to write the history and create the recognition. And the great thing about this year compared to 2000 was that when in 2000 the reception was so critical and in a way damaging, this year the, the reception was extraordinary. And I think the, uh, the community, at least in this city, and the people who look to Tate, have, it has changed extraordinarily. And it's changed because the world has changed, uh, we live in shifting times, uh, certainties are collapsing all around us, as we know, um, and audiences have changed. Uh, there is a new type of audience who wants to be engaged, who wants to be critical. Um, and in this scenario, I don't think we can any longer have a world view. It's not possible. Uh, we speak from a place, from a time, an agenda. Uh, all of us have biases of age, uh, birth, and race. And uh, you know, I do, my colleagues do, our audiences do. And therefore, uh, that's just to show you the international remit of the collection now. Thinking about um, the display of the tape this time was um, in a much more fluid way. Uh, instead of themes and subjects, we've chosen approaches to our approaches that allow visitors to take their own journeys in the old building, which is uh, called the Boiler House, four approaches to art, or four context, uh, 1900 to 2000. And in the Switch House, which is the new building, uh, taking off uh, from 1960 and looking at the, that moment in time where art became more active, where artists began to ask more of their audiences. And across the piece, it's very much based on a much more inclusive reading of the 20th century art taking into account lots of local histories and local contexts, but then really trying to seek out the connections between them. So it's not random, but in place of a kind of master narrative, uh, many narratives. So histories we're familiar with uh, are only one, or only some of the possible narratives in a complex networked history. And it felt uh, you know, deeply ironic that just a few days uh, after we opened the new Tech Modern, Brexit happened. Uh, and the one you know, shining light that uh, uh, gave us cause to cheer was that you know, Tech Modern, you can travel from Beijing to Bromley without a visa. Um, you know, this is where L London is open at Tech Modern. London is open as an international city, and you can travel the world for free. Um, but I just want to show you a few images to show you what that transition means, not in rhetoric, 
but in actually in terms of the art on display in the galleries. This is a, um, an image of the way <coughs> we used to display um, uh, a number of artists who were active uh, in the immediate post-war period. We have to be a bit flexible with chronology uh, in relation to the collection because we have so few works. So although uh, Picasso's Three Dancers is slightly out of sync here, it, it, it fits the purpose. But Germain Richier, uh, Jackson Pollock, Matter, and uh, a Picasso Three Dancers. But looking at what happened to the figure in, in the kind of transition from um, surrealism uh, to a kind of new images of man moment uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, using some of the great works in the collection and putting them into a room, the other side of which had our, our kind of hardcore surrealist holdings. Now, with working with new acquisitions and really expanding the geographical narrative of that post-war uh, decade, uh, we have rehung some of those works and some of those artists uh, in a display entitled The Disappearing Figure, Art uh, uh, After Catastrophe, which really looks at the emergence of a, a particular kind of take on uh, the figure and the erasure of the figure in gesture uh, after the war, after the Holocaust, after the revelations of the Holocaust, after the atomic explosions in Hiroshima and, uh, uh, in, in 1945, and during the, uh, the first period of decolonization when uh, artists from Africa uh, and Asia and uh, uh, were, were kind of uh, meeting modernity for the first time. And what's so interesting is that this is the, a period where in many centres there is uh, the development of a kind of hybrid modernity. And, gosh, I haven't done this for a long time. This painting here on the left by uh, the Sudanese modernist Ibrahim El Salahi he came to the Slade in the 1950s. Uh, he came as a realist painter uh, in London. He thought about Graham uh, Sutherland. He thought about uh, Francis Bacon, but he also discovered Picasso. And he uh, found in Picasso an appropriation of Af the African tribal mast, and he took it back <coughs> metaphorically from the Western artists. He reappropriated uh, the kind of sense of the African tribal, but he also explored uh, uh, Arabic calligraphy, and the landscape of the Sudan and created a, a kind of vision of a kind of new humanity, which is storytelling, which has multiple references and, and is inescapably his own Sudanese modern voice. Um, in this image, sorry, likewise, uh, Wilfredo Lam, Cuban artist of, of Chinese descent, somebody who uh, uh, discovered uh, modern European art on the outbreak of the uh, Spanish Civil War in Madrid, uh, and then travelled like many emigres to Paris, where he met Picasso for the first time. In Picasso's studio, he saw African tribal masks for the first time. Like Ibrahim al Salahi, he thought they belong to me, embraced uh, tribal art or African, the kind of locality in his work, but, but also engaged with a very acute understanding of Western modernism. Uh, those artists were working at a time when other artists in Europe were exploring different ideas of the primitive, the cobra group. Uh, we even have here in this display two very small paintings here by Ernst Mankoba, South African-born artist who came to Paris, who got involved with the cobra group, who then married Sonia Fairlove, uh, one of the artists within that group, and introduced those artists, Carol Apple, Constant, uh, Asker Yorn, uh, to uh, uh, African tribal art, uh, Aplin, um, Wilfredo, uh, sorry, uh, Norman Lewis up here, uh, Afro-American uh, artist associated with uh, experiments uh, with the abstract expressionism group, the emergence of a, a, a modern um, gestural material-based practice in Japan, the, the, the Gutai group, all these uh, avant-gardes from many different centres deeply in contact with each other through magazines. This was an era of mass migration, uh, migration voluntary and much enforced. And all of that created this uh, hugely uh, uh, dynamic cultural uh, melting point. And I kind of mix, and I, many different people have commented on it. You know, it's, it's a hybrid modernism, it's decolonized 
modernism, it's a synthetic, syncretic, so on and so forth. But it all kind of means the same thing as artists cannibalizing each other's conventions and histories uh, to create something authentically their own. And I think all of this means we, all of us, need to move on from the old idea that everything that happened in Africa or Asia happened as a result of something that happened in Europe or North America. There is a conversation, and it's, it's, it, it's a multi-positioned uh, conversation. It's backwards and forwards. And then the same thing you can see in relation to what we've done with um, that kind of post-minimal moment. This is a display of uh, Arte Povera and a post-minimal uh, American kind of... Uh, experimental work from the 1970s that we made in 2009 showing some great new acquisitions at that time uh, and this is the reconfiguring of that moment with the new work we've done with that collection looking at that moment from the perspective of Tokyo and Tokyo um, Expo 1970 was an incredible moment where artists from Europe and North America at the invitation of their um, Japanese peers with whom they were in regular uh, contact and dialogue, uh, met together and worked together pr to produce an extraordinary and highly uh, you know, radical presentation of work where the affinities are much, much stronger than their differences. Interest in materials, in a kind of relationship to the body and process, um, and so deep affinities and friendships. So this is a, so th the idea that it's the same history, it's the same kind of uh, narratives but seen from a very different perspective and once you move that perspective all sorts of things uh, are reconfigured in a really fascinating way. Um, then of course minimalism had great minimalist holdings. I love our collection. This was one of the most beautiful hangs to work on, not hang, an installation in 2006 with Robert Morris, Joe Bear, uh, Carl Andre's Bricks, Solar Witt, uh, John of Judd, Mangold, absolute classic minimalism. Um, that moment reconfigured in the New Tech Modern in the Switch House, you can just see Carl Andre's bricks uh, over there. And this is Tony Cragg's stack piece. This is Ronnie Horn's Pink Tons. All a kind of conventional post minimalist narrative. But then you begin to see the kind of complexity as someone like Charlotte Posmenska, who had a very engaged social practice in Germany, um, Rashid Arin, Pakistani born artists living and working in London, Yayu Kusama. This is the global narrative about what's happened to the object from 1960s to the present day. One of the things that I really love about this display is that three of the really strong works in it, really noteworthy works that people said, wow, when they came into the room, are made by artists who I first came across as the wives of important artists. <laughs> so, for example, um, this fantastic piece by Marissa Mertz, uh, wife of the better known Mario Mertz, and uh, artist who had no studio outside her own house. And this is a work she made in the course of the 1970s in her kitchen. Um, and then, of course, Christina Iglesias, uh, for many years uh, under the, in the shadow of her husband, Juan Munoz. And in the other room here, what we can't see in this picture, fantastic piece by Mary Martin. Uh, really, you know, dazzling. Uh, uh, so many uh, visitors from abroad, from America, uh, from Latin America, never heard of uh, Mary Martin and uh, just uh, really responded to it. And then, of course, you know, real narratives in history. Somebody here like Salah Rouret de uh, 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 interesting, Beirutti based artist who did her training in Paris under Leger, but then evolved her very singular practice, again, fusing aspects of Western abstraction with a sense of um, uh, Arabic calligraphy. And uh, at, at some point in the 1960s, arriving at a very similar practice to Carl Andre, using identical building bricks configured in different ways. Um, so a great unveiling of enormously rich, but kind of still unwritten history. Um, so much work to be done, so many different uh, opportunities to uh, tell that story. Um, just a footnote to that, beyond you know, work in the conventional gallery, of course, the story that those two images that I began with, Tanya Bergera and Kandinsky, the story that 
those two images tell is a story of artists increasing engagement with audiences and one of the things that museums are really bad at doing and it's where we do still feel like prisons is locking up works or putting them on pedestals putting them behind barriers and not letting the public interact with them in the way they should they are not prisoners of the museum they really need to be in contact and for the first time at Tate Modern we've been able to let loose Robert Morris's mirror cubes into the gallery. They were first shown at Tate in London in 1971 on the lawn in front of Mil Tate Millbank. Mm -hmm. So you know, absolutely open. They were only taken off display because the seagulls <laughs> found them hugely attractive as places to leave their deposits. Um, you know, Rashid Irene's Zero to Infinity and Charlotte Posnenska's Interactive Cube. So these you know, at last, after many years of these works being locked up, either in storage or behind barriers, the public can do with them what the artist intended. Um, pop, uh, another story that we think of very conventionally, uh, American pop, the power, uh, you know, the power of uh, the 1960s culture, um, popular music, advertising, uh, American food, opulence, but of course this was the moment of the Cold War, and pop had many resonances across the globe. Uh, last year we did a great show called The World Goes Pop, and I suppose one of the legacies of that show is the collecting we uh, have done around the show before it. The show came out of thinking about the collection, and this reconfiguration of pop really shows the, the kind of, um, uh, the, 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 the way pop can be reconfigured to encapsulate a, a kind of exploration of realism around uh, popular culture uh, and commerce and capitalism, both from a, a celebratory but also a critical perspective uh, in cultures that are both free and in cultures that are totalitarian during the 1960s. So Fougeron, artists really closely associated with Soviet socialist realism in the background alongside um, Iranian, Pavis Tanavoli, Boris Orloff, uh, um, um, from uh, uh, Russia, um, early um, uh, conceptual artist uh, in the Soviet Union, and then uh, artists such as um, Beatrice, Gonza uh, Beatrice Gonzalez, the curtain on the left-hand wall. So a much more generous, uh, provocative uh, global reading of pop, and it's not a reading that anybody's written a book about, because the great thing about displays of permanent collections like slide lectures is that you can move things around. So many of these juxtapositions in the galleries or collections are in some ways propositions pointing to a possible history, a possible connection. But wherever, wherever uh, it can happen, those connections are made on the basis of real connections of, of networks. This is kind of network model of art history rather than that linear art history that we're more used to. Um, of course, as we move away from the canon, we move away from all the, uh, the prick props, the things that hold our values. Uh, if you dismantle the guidelines, you take away the rule book, you move away from the idea of winners and losers, and uh, you leave um, the terrain uh, perhaps uh, for more uncertain waters. Uh, where is the authority to say this is good, this is important? Um, I think that in place of that canon, we have to put uh, in place uh, what Stuart called temporary stabilizations, which really uh, are, are, are positions where we are aware of the shifting nature of truth and value. And I think this is, comes back to this idea that museum of the 21st century is that the rule book has been or is fast disappearing. We're not going to rewrite it. <coughs> We're moving towards a situation of temporary stabilizations. Um, so when we think of a display like this at Tate Modern Living Cities, where we have much more contemporary art, uh, artists from de very different parts of the world that have been seen in very different contexts. So Julia Moretu, top of her game, represented by White Cube, great painting at the back of the room, on the floor, this map of Beirut by Lebanese artist uh, uh, Rashmui, somebody who's well known on the kind of alternative scene, but you won't find his work at Sotheby's or Christie's. And then on the right hand side, the Egyptian uh, conceptual artist Neil Yalta, who is only now in her very late 70s, got her first dealer. So 
artists coming out of very, very different terrains, but all of their work can be seen in some ways as a critique of uh, culture in the city in the 21st century. So in order to help us on that, uh, in those shifting sands and have those conversations, we have a new space of Tate Modern which is called Tate Exchange. It's a project that I feel uh, really close to uh, and it's a place to ask questions and where uh, members of the public meet artists and curators to ask those questions. And it's an experimental space, it's just started and it will evolve over time. Um, these are a couple of images from its opening, people making performances, saying why exchange is important to them. And the first of a number of residencies will take, that will take place when we invited the Gorilla Girls mm -hmm. on the occasion of their exhibition at the Whitechapel to occupy the space and set up a bureau of complaints. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of people really enjoying complaining about a lot of things. And <laughs> if we had that in place this week, I know <laughs> people would be complaining about it. Yeah. Um, my predecessor at uh, Tate, uh, Chris Durkon, always used to talk about the Turbine Hall as a 21st century agora. But I wonder who goes to an agora these days. I've just been to Athens at the weekend, mm -hmm. and I went to the agora, and they were all tourists. Um, or at least uh, they were when I went there. And at Tate, uh, the agora is full of people like you and me. Uh, they are the equivalent of the carriage folk who attended uh, the royal opening of the National Gallery of British Art uh, at Millbank in 1897. But interestingly, more numerous than the carriage folk, uh, are told by Frances Spalding, Frances Spalding in her great history of the Tate, were the poor uh, local families, the working people, and in particular the board children. They weren't bored, they were from board schools, that's the local state schools, who came to play in the fountain. I think the fountain was really important in the early years of Tate. And of course, um, we replaced that with a fountain, uh, <laughs> Duchamp's Orion, on which the bored children find much more difficult to understand than the fountain that played in the, uh, lo in the lobby of the old Tate. And you know, in a way, this is the great challenge, that uh, this work, the fountain, continues to challenge the conventions of art. It's all about context. It upholds that notion of context as a determining factor in value. But what is the context of the contemporary museum that will bring back the board children? And as director, that, I suppose, is my big problem. Um, this is a co collection of public ownership. It's yours. It's the nation's. And only a certain number of people, only Hillary's voters are coming to Tate, only the Remain voters. Um, so, uh, you know, Boris Groys has spoken of the traditional museum as a place of things and the contemporary museum as a place of events. But when he writes about that, he implies that the museum is, has this authority and the audience is receptive and passive. And uh, we know that this is the new audience of Tate Modern. They're not receptive and they're not passive. Um, that's them uh, demonstrating in favor of our education in schools, bring steam back out with STEM, and there uh, they are in the galleries. You know, they're, they're getting down on their knees. Um, outside the walls of the gallery, this is happening. Inside is a place of debate, outside is a place of contestation. Uh, these are the, the women who demonstrated on the day we opened uh, against Carl Andre, acquitted of the murder of his wife, Anna Mendieta, but nevertheless there is a trace of passion amongst this uh, you know, vociferous community who supports her. The Tate undoubtedly has become a platform, a stage, a kind of public space, uh, it's different to the Agora. Uh, I don't know what we call it, but it's going to be a very interesting journey. And I think that, you know, uh, last night's uh, a result uh, means it's a, a journey we need to take very seriously. So while we love the Kandinsky and we want there always to be a place at Tate and our museums for our works of art that recede from real life, that allow us spaces for contemplation, you know, deep engagement, uh, spiritual nourishment, uh, all that stuff that we love, it's also really a place where we have to get to grips with this kind of practice. Um, Tanya Bruguera um, is standing for the presidency of Cuba. Now, it's not open to a democratic election, 
so we can't really vote for her, but if we could, she would have my vote. Mm -hmm. I hope she would have yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you.